Good morning and welcome to this month's GI Journal Club. My name is Ji Young Bang and for the next 30 minutes we'll be reviewing some very interesting and high impact articles published uh, this month. Our first study is a randomized trial from the New England Journal of Medicine where they compared an adjuvant nivolumab in resected esophageal or G-junction cancer. Esophageal cancer is the seventh most common cancer worldwide, responsible for 500,000 deaths per year. The standard of care for resectable, locally advanced esophageal or G-junction cancer is uh, to um, give neoadjuvant therapy, followed by surgical resection. However, the risk of recurrent can be up to 75%. To date, there have been no suitable adjuvant treatments available after neoadjuvant chemo uh, radiation therapy and surgery. The aim of the randomized trial was therefore to evaluate nivolumab, which is a fully human monoclonal anti-programmed DEATH1 antibody for adjuvant therapy after neoadjuvant chemo radiation and surgery for esophageal um, and G junction cancer. Nivolumab was given as an IV infusion every two weeks for 16 weeks, and then every four weeks from week 17 onwards up to one year. And so this was a phase three randomized trial. A phase three randomized trial just means that you are comparing a new drug with the placebo. And so this was placebo controlled, which means nivolumab is compared with placebo. In this study, two, for every two patients uh, assigned to nivolumab, one patient was assigned to placebo. It was also double blind, which means neither the investigator nor the patient knows which treatment they're receiving. The study was conducted over the period of about three years at 170 sites from 29 countries. So all patients with stage two or three adenocarcinoma or squamous cell carcinoma of the esophagus and um, G-junction was um, included. Uh, every patient received neoadjuvant chemo radiation therapy and surgical resection for four to 16 weeks prior to randomization. And the resected specimens showed at least T1 or N1 disease. Treatment was continue, continued until disease recurrence or until the patient um, experienced any unacceptable adverse events. The median follow-up was uh, um, just over two years. The primary outcome was disease-free survival. Secondary outcome measure was adverse events. So these are the baseline characteristics. Um, please can you uh, mute your microphone, everybody? Especially Mr. Bruce, Dr. Bruce, thank you. All right. So uh, the baseline characteristic shows that uh, the majority of patients had a stage three um, uh, stage three um, esophageal or G-junction cancer, just uh, about uh, two thirds of the patients. Um, and 71% had adenocarcinoma and 29% had squamous cell carcinoma. This is the Kaplan-Meier curve for um, comparing uh, disease-free survival between the nivolumab group and placebo. And so you can see that the Disease-free survival is better with nivolumab than placebo. And as you can see, if you compare the median disease-free survival, the survival with nivolumab is twice as long as the placebo at 22 months versus 11 months. If you're looking at the hazard ratio for disease recurrence, it's significantly lower for uh, nivolumab compared to placebo uh, with p-value of less than 0.001, which means that this is statistically significant. They then look at disease-free survival according to cancer type. So this is again the Kaplan-Meier curve. And as you can see, when you do a subgroup analysis comparing just patients with adenocarcinoma and then take just patients with squamous cell carcinoma, survival again is longer for nivolumab compared to placebo for adenocarcinoma at 19 months versus 11.1 uh, months. And for squamous cell carcinoma, uh, the difference is quite marked. Uh, about 30 months versus 11 months for placebo. Uh, 
again, when looking at distant MET's free survival, nivolumab resulted in uh, longer survival at 28 months versus just 17 months for placebo. Now, adverse events did occur, occurred quite commonly, in fact, 96% in the nivolumab group, 93% in uh, the placebo group. So, uh, serious adverse events counted about 30% in the nivolumab group and 30% of the placebo group. Now, when you're looking at serious events that was related to either to the drug, it was 8% in the, in the nivolumab and 3% in the placebo group. So in patients with esophageal or GE junction cancer, status post neoadjuvant chemo radiation therapy and surgery, neolivumab adjuvant therapy was associated with um, significantly longer disease-free survival compared with placebo. This is uh, our next study, a randomized trial comparing albumin infusions in hospitalized patients with cirrhosis. Liver disease accounts for 2 million deaths per year worldwide. And decompensated cirrhosis, patients are susceptible to infection, which can then lead to renal dysfunction and death. So guidelines recommend giving IV albumin infusions when patients undergo large volume paracentesis, or they are diagnosed with SBP, spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, and hepatorenal syndrome. However, to date, there are no conflicting data on the role of IV albumin infusion in preventing infection, renal failure, and death in decompensated cirrhosis. The aim of the uh, study was to compare the use of IV albumin infusion to increase the serum albumin to above 30 gram per liter versus the standard care in the incidence of infection, renal dysfunction, or death in patients with decompens decompensated cirrhosis. So this was a randomized trial, multi-center. Unlike the last study, this was an open label study, which means that investigators and, and patients are able to know uh, which treatment they're getting. This was uh, conducted in the United Kingdom over a period of three and a half years. Included were well, all hospitalized patients with decompensated cirrhosis and low serum albumin level less than 30 gram per liter. And randomization was either to the albumin group, which means that they received daily infusion of 20% IV albumin with the aim of maintaining albumin above 35 gram per liter so that it would, so that the investigators can ensure that it definitely stayed above 30 gram per liter, which is what they're aiming for, uh, versus standard medical care. The albumin group received maximum of 14 days of uh, albumin post-randomization. And for standard care group, IV albumin, IV albumin was administered only per recommended guidelines. For example, in patients undergoing paracentesis, um, SBP, and hepatorenal syndrome. Follow-up was up to six months. The primary outcome measure was the comms endpoint of the incidence of infection from any cause, renal dysfunction or death between day three and 15 of randomization. And secondary outcome measures were uh, each component of the primary endpoint, so incidence of infection or renal dysfunction or deaths, and the total amount of albumin administered. These are the baseline characteristics. So the majority of the patients had alcoholic cirrhosis, 91% and 80, uh, 88%. Um, uh, 380 patients were in the albumin group, 397 in the standard care group. The most common cause for admission uh, was new onset or worsening ascites at 62% and 71%. And um, about 80% uh, of patients had um, um, albumin levels ranging from 20 to 29 gram per liter. The, uh, the median MEL scores were 19.6 in the albumin group and 19.5 uh, in the standard care group. This is the daily mean albumin serum albumin level. And as you can see, uh, not surprisingly, the albumin group had significantly higher levels of albumin throughout the, uh, throughout the treatment period, um, and mainly uh, staying above 30. And for the standard care group, albumin kind of hovered around 24 to 25. 
this is the results of the primary endpoint. And as you can see, if you look at the composite of primary endpoint, so this means that if the patient developed new infection or renal failure or death, then that was counted as one incident. And then they compare the incidence between the albumin and the standard care group. And as you can see, it was about 30% in both groups with adjusted odds ratio of 0 0.98. And the p-value was not significant at 0 0.87. This means that there was no difference in the incidence of the composite of primary endpoint um, between the albumin and the standard care group. When you look at the total median um, quantity of albumin infused per patient, it was 200 grams in the albumin group and 20 grams in the standard care group. Um, when comparing the adverse events, the um, incidence of um, severe adverse events from grade three uh, to grade five, um, um, it was 28, 17, and 42 in the albumin group, 11, 13, and 48 in the standard care group. The um, types of adverse events encountered included, uh, included pulmonary edema fluid overload, which occurred in 23 patients in the albumin group compared to just eight in the standard care group. And GI bleeding occurred in 11 in the albumin group and 13 in the standard care group. The limitations uh, for this study is the lack of blinding and therefore uh, risk of bias. But the investigations do explain that it was important to do this so as to um, avoid volume overloading patients who were assigned uh, standard therapy um, by giving fluid that looks similar to albumin but was, you know, but was not. Now, um, the study therefore shows that in patients with decompensated cirrhosis, albumin infusion to increase and maintain albumin to above 30 gram per liter did not show any benefit when compared to standard treatment. Our next study is the randomized trial comparing terlipressin with albumin for the treatment of type one hepatorenal syndrome. This was again published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Type 1 hepatic renal syndrome is rapidly progressing renal failure in patients with decompensated cirrhosis and ascites. It's often fatal. Terlipressin is a vasopressin analog, which causes vasoconstriction of the splanchnic and the systemic vasculature, which acts to reduce the portal blood flow and reduce portal hypertension and basically increase effective arterial volume in the systemic circulation, therefore improving renal perfusion pressure and decreasing compensatory renal and systemic vasoconstriction. The aim of the study was to confirm efficacy and safety of terlipressin and albumin versus placebo and albumin in patients with cirrhosis and hepatorenal syndrome. This was a randomized trial Again, double blind, so neither the patient nor the investigator knows um, whether they're getting telepressin or placebo, um, and of course, placebo controlled. Um, telepressin and albumin was compared to placebo and albumin in a two to one ratio. Uh, this was again conducted over a three year period between 2016 and 2019. Included were all patients with cirrhosis and ascites and rapidly worsening renal function defined as a uh, doubling of the creatinine to at least above 2.25 milligram per deciliter within 14 days prior to the randomization. Excluded were patients with extremely high creatinines above seven milligram per deciliter or those receiving recent renal replacement therapy. If the patient had other possible reversible causes of renal failure, such as large volume parasin paracentesis or sepsis and severe cardiovascular disease. The primary outcome measure was the reversal of hepatorenal syndrome, defined as two consecutive serum creatinine less than 1.5 milligram per deciliter, more than two hours apart, up to, 14, uh, up to uh, day 14, without the need for renal replacement therapy for more than 10 days. These are the baseline characteristics. 199 patients were enrolled in the Turley pressing group, 101 in the placebo group. Uh, the most common cause of cirrhosis in the enrolled patients was alcohol. Um, SIRS, or systemic inflammatory response syndrome, was present in 42% of the telepressing group, 48% of the placebo group. The um, mean serum creatinine group 
um, serin creatinine was 3.5 in the telepressin group and 3.5 in the placebo group. The mean MEL score was 33 in telepressin and again 33 in placebo. The, uh, when comparing the endpoint, the primary endpoint of verified reversal of paterenal syndrome, uh, this occurred in 32% in the telepressant group compared to only 17% in the placebo group. And this was statistically significant with a p-value of 0 0.006. When they looked at other endpoints, uh, i.e. Um, hepatorenal syndrome reversal with no need for renal replacement therapy up to 30 days. This was again um, much um, better for telepressin at 34% versus only 17% for placebo. And again, this was significant. Again, we're looking at the reversal of hepatorenal syndrome in patients with SIRS. Uh, this occurred in 37% in the telepressin group compared to only 6% in the placebo group. And again, this was statistically significant. When looking at verified reversal of hepatorenal syndrome with no recurrence up to 30 days, there was a trend towards an improve, uh, improvement a great improvement with telepressin at 26% versus 17% with placebo, but the p-value was not statistically significant at 0 0.08. Now looking at the adverse events between the telepressin and placebo groups. The occurrence of adverse event of any severity occurred in 88% in telepressin and 89% in the placebo group. Adverse events leading to discontinuation of the trial regime occurred in 12% in the telepressin compared to only 5% in the placebo group. The most common causes of death up to 90 days of follow-up were hepatobiliary disorders, respiratory disorders, and as you can see the difference is quite marked between telepressin and placebo group at 11 versus 2%, and infection, which was 7 in telepressin versus 3% in the placebo. The main limitation of uh, the study is that the authors say that the study was not how to take difference in survival between the two groups. So the main take home point is that in patients with decompensated cirrhosis and hepatorenal syndrome type 1, the use of telepressin with albumin was more efficacious than placebo uh, plus albumin in reversing the hepatorenal syndrome type 1. However, um, uh, one should be mindful that telepressin was associated with serious adverse events, especially pulmonary adverse events. Our next study is the ABC score. This is a new risk score that accurately predicts mortality and acute upper and lower GI bleeding. And this was an international multi-center study published in gastroenterology um, this year. Upper and lower GI bleeding is a common medical emergency. The existing scores for upper and lower GI bleeding are poor predictors for mortality. And these include the Glasgow Blatchford scores, Rocco scores, the Progetto Nazionale Hemorrhagia Dastavia um, score and AIM-65. The aim of um, the study was to develop a new pre-endoscopy risk score to accurately predict mortality risk in patients presenting with upper and lower GI bleeding. So this was an international cohort study, um, which was conducted in three parts. Part, way, part A is when the patient is when the authors developed a risk score. Part two involves validation of this new risk score, and part C involves comparing the new risk score with existing scores. The primary outcome measure was all-cause mortality at 30 days of follow-up. So part A, score development. The authors used prospectively collected data on 3,012 patients with upper GI bleeding that were admitted between March 2014 and March 2015. And they tried to identify um, factors associated with mortality at 30 days post-admission using logistic regression analysis. And then that led to the generation of a weighted risk score. So this is the score that they developed. This is known as the ABC scores, A for age, B for blood tests, and C for comorbidity.
And as you can see, different scores are assigned according to the amount of risk involved. So for example, highest risk person would be anyone age over the uh, 75 or, um, or more uh, in, um, in age, um, elevated urea, low albumin, uh, elevated keratinin, who then presented with altered mental status, who had cirrhosis, uh, or uh, worse yet, disseminated malignancy and high ASA score. And what they found that, that this score had the ability to predict a 30-day mortality uh, of um, 0 0.86. Um, and so they predict they, the 0.86 refers to the area under the curve. And I'll go through that in a little bit more detail um, for the, in the next slide. And so this value uh, taken at face value 0.86 means that it is a good score for predicting mortality. They then calculated the risk of death uh, between the different score levels. So if you have three or, three or less, uh, a score of three or less, the risk of death is less than 1%. However, if you have a very high score of eight or more, the risk of death is about 34%. So next is score validation. So they took this ABC score that they came up with, and then they compared it. Um, uh, and so they validated uh, using patients um, you, from databases, uh, from hospitals in Italy, uh, Spain, and Israel, and United Kingdom, uh, from patients who were admitted with upper and lower GI bleeding. They were able to validate the score on over 4,000 patients who, ad, who were admitted with upper GI bleeding and 2 point, uh, or sorry, 2,300 patients presenting with lower GI bleeding. And again, they looked at the ability of the score to predict accurately mortality at 30 days. So as you can see, the ABC scores was accurate in predicting a 30-day mortality in this validation cohort with the area under the receive operating characteristic curve of 0.81. Anything above 0.8 is considered to be um, a good score. Um, and again, for lower GI bleeding, the ABC score was accurate in predicting a 30-day mortality with the area under the receive operating characteristic uh, score of 0.84. So next, they're looking at score comparison. How does the ABC score compared with the current existing scores uh, for risk assessment in GI bleeding? So patients with upper GI bleeding, ABC scores were compared with the AIM-65 score. So in patients with lower GI bleeding, ABC scores compared with AIM-65, the Glasgow Blatchford score, and the Oakland score. They used the same databases as they did for the validation phase for the score comparison part of the study. So this is an actual uh, receiver operating character, uh, um, receiver operating characteristic, uh, receiver operating characteristic uh, uh, curve, and um, I'll just go through that um, in a little bit more detail. So this ROC curve basically compares is a graph essentially that compares sensitivity in the y-axis and uh, one minus specificity in the x-axis. This line depicts, um, is, is a line going through at 45 degrees. The main important thing to remember about the ROC curve is the area under. So anything under the curve is the, uh, anything underneath is the actual, is the area. So if you look at this straight line, anything under the straight line gives you an area under the straight line of 0 0.5. This means that it is uh, not good at uh, dis discerning between the presence or absence of a disease. So as you can see, this green curve is the uh, curve for the ABC score uh, in the derivation phase. And the blue is the ABC score, the valid validation phase. And as you can see, the area is 0 0.86 and 0 0.81. So this means that the area under the curve is 0 0.86 and 0 0.81 specifically. And as you can see, it's higher than the area under the curve that was given by the AIM-65 score, which is only 0 0.65. So this means that the higher, are, higher the area under the curve, the better the score is at depicting whether the patient does or does not have the disease. So in this case, um, the ABC score is better than the AIM score 
at deciding whether at predicting whether a patient will or will not develop will not will or will not um, um, uh, die basically from upper or lower uh, from uh, upper uh, or lower GI bleed. So this was the score comparison for the upper GI bleed. Next, similar pattern is seen when looking when comparing ABC score with other scores for lower GI bleeding. So the area, so the uh, score that gives you the greatest area under the curve again is the curve in blue, which is uh, the ABC score, and the next best. Um, would be the AIM-65 followed by GBS, the Glasgow, uh, the Glasgow Bachelor score, and then the Oakland score. The limitation of this study is that 31%, 31% of patients in the school development cohort did not undergo endoscopy. And so the correlation of the ABC score with endoscopy findings is not clear. Main take home point is that ABC score has a good performance for predicting mortality in patients with upper GI and lower GI bleeding. Therefore, the score will, the score will allow early identification of high-risk patients for close monitoring and targeted therapy. This is our last study looking at colonos colonos colonoscopist performance and colorectal cancer risk after adenoma removal to stratify surveillance. This was published in Gastroenterology. Surveillance guidelines for corrective cancer largely depends on the number and type of lesions removed during the screening colonoscopy. But the quality of the colonoscopy as measured by the adenoma detection rate of the colonoscopist also likely has an effect on the risk of the patient developing colorectal cancer. The aim of the study was to evaluate the impact of the colonoscopist performance on the risk of colorectal cancer after adenoma removal. So this was a large cohort study using database from the Polish Colorectal Cancer Screening Program. They looked at 173,288 patients who underwent screening colonoscopies over a um, um, 11 year period from January 2000 to uh, December 2011. The follow-up was until December th uh, 31st, 2017. They also looked at the Austrian colonoscopy screening program to validate uh, their results. And this Austrian colonoscopy screening program comprised 137, uh, 169 patients. So low risk uh, lesions removed uh, in the study was defined as having two adenomas, one or two that were uh, all less than one centimeter in size. High risk lesions were tubular adenomas, uh, one centimeter or more. Those who had high grade dysplasia on the resected specimens, villus or tubular villus histology, or uh, three or more adenomas. The endoscopist performance was considered low if the adenoma detection rate was less than 20% and high and considered high performance if the adenoma detection rate was 20% uh, or more. So this is the this table shows the risk of developing interval cancer after screening colonoscopy at 10 years. So during the 10-year follow-up in this Polish um, colonoscopy screening program database, patients had, sorry, 443 interval cancers were diagnosed. Now, this table shows you the risk of developing colorectal cancer according to whether the patient had no adenoma, low-risk adenoma, or high-risk adenomas detected during their screening colonoscopy, and they perform a subgroup analysis. So they look to see what the risk is compared to the adenoma detection rate of your um, colonoscopist. So if the patients and the screening colonoscopy had no adenomas resected, the risk of developing colon cancer was 0.3% if your colonoscopy was done by um, a low performance endoscopist compared to just 0.15% if your endoscopist was considered a high performer. And this difference uh, was significant with p-value of less than 0.01. If you look at the hazard ratio, if you're in the group that had, if you had no adenomas resected during your screening colonoscopy, 
you had almost twice the risk of developing interval colon cancer if your colonoscopy was performed by a low performing endoscopist. And again, the same pattern is seen whether you had low risk adenomas resected during your string colonoscopy and also high risk adenoma. The risk is significantly higher for developing interval cancer if, you, if your colonoscopy was performed by a colonoscopist with a low adenoma detection rate. Again, this was validated in the Austrian cohort. The limitation of this study is that it's a register-based study, and there is no information on possible confounders that can affect risk of colon cancer, such as smoking or BMI. The study is not really applicable for patients who had serrated lesions because it consisted very small proportion of patients. And also in the Austrian validation cohort, the uh, follow-up was very short. So take home point, individuals undergoing colonoscopies by low performing colonoscopists have increased risk of developing colon cancer compared to those by high performing colonoscopists. Therefore, combination of colonoscopist performance and lesion characteristics should be applied when determining surveillance intervals. I know we're a little bit uh, um, running out of time, but just a quick recap. In patients with esophageal or G-junction cancer, nivolumab adjuvant therapy was associated with significantly longer disease-free survival compared with placebo. In patients with decompensated cirrhosis, albumin infusion did not show any added benefit compared to standard treatment. In decompensated cirrhosis with hepatorenal syndrome type 1, telepressin was more efficacious than placebo in reversing HRS1. ABC score has good performance for predicting mortality in patients with upper and lower GI bleeding. And individuals undergoing colonoscopies by low performing colonoscopists have increased risk of interval colorectal cancer compared to with those with high performing uh, colonoscopists. This wraps up our journal club. Our next GI journal club will be on May 5th, 2021, which is the first Wednesday of May. Thank you again so much for joining us and I look forward to seeing you next month.